How's it going? Chapter 12, Lecture 1. We are out of genetics and into uh, the molecular component of genetics, which is DNA. Uh, in this lecture, we're going to talk specifically about how various experiments led to our understanding of not just DNA, but how DNA uh, ultimately codes for proteins and then, uh, and then how those proteins are expressed to give rise to the traits that we talked about um, during the genetics unit. We have learned a great deal of uh, information over the course of the last few hundred years, most notably probably in the last 50 years, in terms of DNA and the molecular side of biology. But um, there have been several experimenters and experiments that have been instrumental in the development of not just the structure of DNA, but ultimately um, our understanding of how DNA works and uh, how DNA is replicated how RNA is transcribed, and ultimately how proteins are translated uh, into a uh, physical expression uh, of a trait. And so if you remember or recall chapter 2, back when we talked about chapter 2, uh, specifically the organic molecules, uh, carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids, you'll remember a term uh, called monomer, okay, monomers and polymers, the monomers being the single subunits of the polymers, uh, and specifically, we're going to talk a little bit about monomer and polymer of protein and nucleic acid. Now, nucleic acid, there are two forms. You've got DNA and RNA. We talked about them then, and we're going to talk about them now. And you know that the monomer of nucleic acid is uh, nucleotides, okay? So at the base level of a DNA molecule, you have individual nucleotides that have been arranged in a basically in a five prime to three prime direction, okay, and by linking individual nucleotides together, you create the uh, the double helix, double stranded molecule of life in DNA, and from that double stranded molecule of life, gives rise to every single protein on the planet, and ultimately every single expressed trait on the planet. Okay, so let's talk about the discoveries um, that have led to the DNA. Uh, and our understanding of DNA. So there are five kind of experiments, um, and I say five because Rosalind Franklin and Watson and Crick kind of worked at the same time, 1950 to 1953, and I know that a lot of these are around the same time. It's kind of post and pre-World War One, or World War Two, rather. Um, and they kind of didn't work together, but they, they kind of their discoveries led to the same kind of thing, the understanding of a three-dimensional model of uh, DNA. And so we're going to start with Griffith. And Griffith, in 1928, uh, basically determined with various experiments that there was a factor that was passed on between bacteria and a host, um, or a bacteria and a, a host cell, that caused bacteria to be either harmless or harmful. Uh, we called harmful bacteria pathogenic. Uh, pathogenic or a pathogen is a disease-causing agent. And so we'll get into his experiment in more detail, but basically he used two strains of bacteria. Um, one was known to be harmful and one was known to be harmless. And over the course of several trials, in the course of several years, he determined that there was something that the bacteria had that allowed them to either be harmful or harmless. Uh, and so we'll talk about that in a minute. Oswald Avery, notice that he came 20 years later. He basically uh, extended Griffith's uh, experimentation one step further. And uh, Griffith basically said that there was a factor. He didn't know if it was protein or uh, nucleic acid, basically protein or DNA but he knew one of those things was instrumental in the development of pathogenicity, meaning one of those things was in charge of making a bacteria harmful or harmless. Avery determined that it was, in fact, DNA and not protein that caused bacteria to be pathogenic. Hershey and Chase, a few years later, took Avery's experiment one step further and said, if Avery proved that bacteria are harmful because of their DNA, I want to find out if viruses are harmful uh, or harmless by their DNA. Okay, and so um, Oswald Avery proved that it was DNA that caused bacteria strains to be pathogenic. Hershey and Chase proved that it was DNA in viral uh, pathogenicity. Uh, and so in both cases, both 
viral and bacteria pathogenicity, DNA was the case uh, in both of them. Shargoff, he was the one that started looking at DNA structure and looked at the relative concentrations of both adenine and thymine and guanine and cytosine. Now we know that A and T are base pairs and C and G are base pairs. And so it makes sense that the relative concentration of C should equal G because they pair together and A should be relatively the same as T. And so he proved that A and T are base pairs and C and G are base pairs. And so we go, we call those complementary base pairs. Rosalind Franklin used X-ray uh, chromatography or X-ray crystallography and she was able to actually use X-rays in order to take a three-dimensional, uh, well I shouldn't say three-dimensional, but she made a picture, took a picture, an X-ray of a chromosome and the structure of DNA that Watson and Crick used a few years later to make their three-dimensional model based on her pictures and there's a big controversial um, you know, fight or conflict between Rosalind Franklin and Watson and Crick uh, because Watson and Crick basically could have, and it's not proven, but they could have used her work uh, without her permission or without giving her credit, and they ended up winning the Nobel Prize in 1953 um, for basically coming up with a, uh, a, a a way to visually represent in a model format the uh, the three-dimensional structure of DNA. So let's talk about Griffith's experiment in more detail, and it is our expectation, both uh, or all three, Mrs. Wickman, Mr. Hamilton, and myself, it is our expectation that you know in depth these, these experiments in order to understand the purpose of the experiment and the conclusion drawn uh, by each experiment. Okay, and so I'll kind of go through these. I'll, I'll talk about the experimental setup. I'll talk about why they did what they did and ultimately the outcome uh, and why that's important. And so remember, 1928, I believe it was, Griffith did this experiment, okay? He used pneumonococcus bacteria. This is actually the bacteria that causes the, uh, the pneumonia, okay? Or a pneumonia to uh, be produced or be um, contracted. And there are two strains of the pneumonococcus bacteria. You have a smooth strain and you have a rough strain. The smooth strain obviously looks smooth, phenotypically smooth. Rough colonies uh, or the rough strain have a rough appearance. The smooth colonies, sometimes just called S cells or the S strain, are pathogenic, meaning they cause disease. The rough colonies, non-pathogenic, completely harmless. You can inject yourself all day long, all year long with the rough colonies and you will not get pneumonia because they are non-pathogenic. Um, he started by taking mice and he injected the smooth colony bacteria, which are pathogenic, into the mice and found that the mice died once they received the injection of smooth colonies. And so he did the opposite. He took rough colonies, he injected the mice with rough colonies, and the mice lived. And so that pretty much proves what we already know. It proves that the uh, smooth strain is pathogenic and it proves that the rough strain is harmless because when you inject a... a a, a pathogenic strain of bacteria into an animal, uh, it makes sense that they die. And when you when you inject a harmless strain into an animal, it makes sense that they lived. He then took it one step further and he heat killed the smooth. And remember, the smooth is the pathogenic. So he subjected the, the pathogenic strain to high levels of heat to kill all the bacteria cells. And it makes sense that when you kill the bacteria cells and then inject them into a mouse, they did not cause disease. So then he took it one step further, okay, fourth trial, and he mixed the heat killed smooth, basically this trial, okay, and that's supposed to be star, apologize, and he mixed the rough colonies, that's a little better star, um, he mixed those two together. Notice that this nothing happened, okay, the mice remained alive in both trials individually, but when he mixed those two together, it caused disease and the mice died. And so the big question was, why? Think about it. If we look at a pictorial representation of this experiment, you'll notice that when you take living S cells, and these are, you know, it, it looks smooth, okay? There are no bumps compared to like this one. Notice that there's kind of a bumpy texture, and I know these these colonies look smooth, but just kind of work with it. It's just uh, it's a picture. These would be the smooth cells. When you inject smooth cells into the mouse, the mouse dies, because that was the pathogenic strain. When you inject the R cells into a mouse, the mouth re mouse remains healthy because these were the non-pathogenic strain. When you take these pathogenic smooth cells and heat kill them and then inject them into the mouse, the mouth remains healthy 
Okay? And then when you mix this one with this one, which are both uh, non-pathogenic by themselves, the mouse dies. Okay? And then further, when you bring out or culture the bacteria cells that killed this mouse, you find that there are living S cells, which are phenotypically identical to the original control S cells. We didn't put living S cells into this mouse, but we were able to actually bring out or uh, uh, pull out culture living S cells from this mouse. And so what happened? Big kind of conclusion was this idea of transformation. Okay, transformation is a vocab word. We're actually going to do a transformation lab this semester, okay, in the next couple weeks, and we're going to take E. coli, which is a bacteria cell, we're going to inject that bacteria cell with a back, um, with a jellyfish plasmid, or a, a bacteria, um, we're going to take a jellyfish plasmid, which is a, uh, a ring of DNA that contains the genes that are expressed as P. glo, okay, they, they produce a bioluminescence protein, we're going to inject that plasmid into bacteria cells, and we're actually going to cause them to change from non-PGLO producers to PGLO producers, and those bacteria cells will actually glow in the dark like a jellyfish would um, when it's subjected to UV light. So transformation is an idea we're going to explore more in the lab, but for now, Griffith was the one that kind of uh, understood or kind of found this idea of transformation. Okay, What happened? The smooth contained plasmids, which are circular rings of DNA, that were not destroyed when we heat killed that bacteria strain. Now remember, we heat killed the smooth strain, but it still contained its DNA. And this DNA was transferred to the live R cells. And once the live R cells produced uh, the proteins that were, um, that were coded for by the smooth pathogenic strain DNA, the rough took on the phenotype of the S and started killing its host. It basically uh, became pathogenic by taking on the DNA from the pathogenic smooth strain. Okay. Avery took Griffith's experiment one step further, and so he said this idea of transformation. Now, Griffith wasn't able to conclude that it was DNA or protein because um, bacteria cells have DNA and protein, and so he said that there was a factor, whether it's DNA or protein, that is going to transform bacteria cells from one strain to another. Um, and so Avery wanted to find out, was it DNA or was it protein? He employed enzymes, and we know how enzymes work. Remember, enzymes have a specific substrate that they act on. Um, that substrate fits into the active site perfectly, just like a lock and key. And so some of these enzymes that he used are called proteases and nucleases. Now, proteases are enzymes that are going to destroy proteins. Proteases, proteins. Nucleases are enzymes that are going to be anti-DNA or anti-nucleic acid enzymes, meaning they're going to destroy nucleic acids. And DNA is a nucleic acid, so it makes sense that it's going to destroy the nucleic acids. The result of the treated colonies that were injected into these mice were that the protein, um, the bacteria that contained protein because we injected anti-DNA enzymes into them, the mice still lived. Um, but the mice that were injected with bacteria that had anti-protein treatment still died. Um, and so how does that prove what causes disease? Well, it proves that DNA must cause the disease because when you take anti-DNA enzymes, which um, pulls the DNA out of the cell or destroys the DNA of the cell, it makes sense that the, the mouse lives because there's no more DNA to code for the pathogenicity of that bacteria cell. And conversely, when you basically destroy the proteins but leave the DNA intact, DNA is ultimately going to make RNA, which ultimately makes more proteins. So you can pull the DNA um, out of a cell and it's going to cause the cell basically to, to terminate its, you know, its functioning. But when you pull all the proteins out of a cell, it still has its DNA, so it's just going to make more proteins. So big conclusion uh, is, must be the DNA that directed the disease. 
Okay, now let's talk a little bit about virus structure and um, because we have to understand virus structure before we understand the Hershey Chase experiment. Virus particles are not living like a bacteria cell or a eukaryotic cell is. They li literally have DNA inside of a protein cup. So DNA would be contained within this nucleus looking structure. It's not a nucleus because again they're not alive. But they keep their DNA in the middle and then they have this protein envelope or this protein coat that keeps the DNA safe. Okay, so Hershey Chase experiment, we're gonna try to get it done in the next five minutes. Um, Hershey Chase experiment, they took the results that Griffith came up with in, in the fact that uh, there was some thing uh, in bacteria cells that was transferred from cell to cell that caused this idea of transformation to happen. Avery took this, the experiment one step further, remember, and said, I'm gonna find out if it's DNA or protein or both. Uh, that's causing this transformation to happen and he concluded that it was DNA not protein that caused the transformation to happen and he was correct. Hershey Chase said if Avery can find out what causes transformation to happen in bacteria cells they want to find out why a virus that aren't living uh, why virus particles are pathogenic as well. Okay and so they employed these bacteriophage and they look like kind of a moon lander from the Apollo 13 mission or or whatever I don't know really know my NASA um, vessels very well but um, it this is an actual virus and this is a picture of a virus so it looks like this this is obviously just kind of a an artist rendition or a, a diagram of what that that virus looks like um, but it's the same thing we just looked at all the DNA is contained within the head of this virus um, there is a sheath that kind of runs through this tail region um, and basically there's a tube that runs through here that the DNA is injected through uh, into the structure of the cell. So if this is the cell membrane uh, and this is a bacteria cell because again these are viruses that only affect bacteria cells. This would be your your bacteria cell. These would be the viruses that are on the surface of the bacteria cell and notice that the DNA strand that was contained within the head of the bacteriophage is injecting the DNA through that sheath and then into the bacteria cell. And then once the bacteria have the viral DNA in it, then all of a sudden the normal, the, the normal cell machinery, the, the enzymes that go through DNA replication, transformation, um, transcription and translation, are going to ultimately make more viral DNA for it and uh, produce more virus that will then affect more cells and more cells. And then that's how you get a viral infection that can get uh, that, that can get pretty nasty and make you sick. And so the reproductive cycle of a bacteriophage and really any virus for that matter is that a bacteriophage or virus comes along, attaches itself to the host cell. In this case, because it's a bacteriophage, the host cell is going to be a bacteria cell. Um, notice that the tail kind of shortens and it plunges this needle-like structure down into the membrane of this bacteria cell and actually injects the DNA into this bacteria cell. Once the bacteria cell has received the DNA of the virus, the bacteria cell thinks that DNA is its own DNA and it actually replicates that DNA over and over and over and over, which in turn produces the viral proteins, which in turn makes the viral particles, which in turn splits the cell open or lyses the cell and releases the mature bacteriophages or mature viruses uh, so that they then are free to go and infect other cells. And that's one of the reasons why, again, um, one single virus or a very small population of virus particles can make you sick really quickly is because they are tricking your own cells into making more of them for them. So, Hershey Chase experiment, they used these bacteriophages and radioactive isotopes, both radioactive phosphorus and radioactive sulfur, to tag bacteria... Uh, bacteriophage proteins and bacteriophage DNA. Okay, and so their, their, their experiment literally used these radioactive markers as beacons, kind of like strobe lights, so that they could tag individual components of this virus, because remember, viruses are just protein and DNA. That's the only thing they are. Um, and so you can, in a sense, you know, use two different radioactive markers and can mark 50% of the virus at a time and kind of trace the movement of the proteins and DNA as that uh, bacteria cell goes on through its life cycle. And so here's the experiment. And I know it looks kind of confusing right now, uh, but just kind of stick with me. 
they took these bacteriophages and bacteria cells and put them into this batch solution number one with radioactive sulfur. Radioactive sulfur is an isotope that is used to radio, radioactively mark proteins. Now notice that all of this bacteria cell is pink, or all of this bacteriophage is pink, um, except for the black DNA, because radioactive sulfur does not mark protein, uh, or does not mark DNA. It only marks protein. Once you allow these bacteriophages that have been radioactively marked with protein to infect uh, bacterial cells, they will inject their DNA, like this one's doing, into the internal components of this bacteria cell, the cytoplasm of this bacteria cell. He then put them through this kind of agitation process, kind of like a blender, it'd be a kind of a fancy scientific blender, and he agitated this, this, this solution in order to knock off or knock from the surface of this bacteria cell these empty protein coats, empty protein shells, kind of like a locust or a cicada shell that you find on trees. Um, it's just an empty shell. It's no longer alive. It does nothing other than just stick there. And so he wanted to knock those off. He then put this solution into a centrifuge, spun it around really fast, and separated the components of the solution by size, these really lightweight, empty protein shells that had the radioactive marked um, isotopes on them were suspended higher in the solution than these really heavy, densely packed uh, bacteria cells with the viral DNA in them. And, and so those made a really heavy pellet that, that kind of sunk to the bottom. What did he conclude? Batch one with the radioactive sulfur attached to the proteins, that all the radioactivity was found outside of this pellet none of the radioactivity was found inside the pellet. And so if you're only marking proteins and all of the radioactivity is kept outside of this pellet, then you can conclude that none of the protein was actually injected into this bacteria cell and it was just protein that was injected into the cell. And so he followed it up with batch two. He put the same quantity of bacteriophages, he put the same quantity of bacteria cells into the solution, but this time he put radioactive phosphorus. Now, we know, um, or maybe you don't know at this point, but one of the backbone components of DNA is phosphorus or phosphate. And so if you add radioactive isotope phosphorus to these bacteriophages, the radioactive phosphorus is going to actually attach to the DNA molecules, not the proteins. And so notice in this case, the DNA molecule is the one that's colored, it's glowing, the protein coat is not. And so the same thing happened bacteriophage injected the DNA into this bacteria cell. He put it through a, an agitation process, kind of like the scientific blender. He knocked the empty protein shells from the outside surface of this bacteria cell. Notice that this, guy, this time um, all the radioactivity is found inside this bacteria cell. And so when he centrifuged it, it's still separated by size. All the really lightweight protein shells that are empty are still suspended above this really heavy bacteria pellet, but all the radioactivity was found inside the pellet. And so what is the big conclusion? Is that in both cases, the DNA was injected into the pellet, the protein coats were kept outside of the pellet, meaning that proteins were never injected into the cell and DNA was always injected into the cell. And he used these radioactivity tracers to actually kind of follow uh, what it was that was actually injected and so he concluded that it was in fact DNA that was injected into the cell. When we get into Chargoff rules really the only thing you need to know is base pair rules um, that adenine and thymine are complementary base pairs A and T, C and G are complementary base pairs and so if you look at this original DNA strand with a complementary DNA strand and you count up the number of A's and T's and the number of C's and G's A and T equal Okay, both in numbers and in percentages, C and G are going to equal both in numbers and percentages. Um, and, and so that's what he concluded, which was really instrumental, like I said, in, in the discovery of not only the structure of DNA, but ultimately how DNA works. Notice over here, this is an adenine, this is a thymine, this is a guanine, this is a cytosine. You will notice that A pairs with T, C pairs with G, A and T have two hydrogen bonds that hold them together. C and G have three hydrogen bonds together. These dotted lines are hydrogen bonds. Those are weaker bonds 
Uh, we've already kind of talked about what hydrogen bonds are, but um, those are going to be the hydrogen bonds that are going to be unzipped and zipped when we replicate or transcribe RNA or DNA. Okay. Now, you'll notice that these two bases are a double-ringed structure, and these two bases are a single-ringed structure. We call these pyrimidines, and we call these purines. Purines are the larger base. Pyrimidines are the smaller base. Uh, and the way I like to remember that is Kansas is a purely agricultural state. Uh, and so if you think of ag, A, and G, A, and G, ag, and pure, as in P-U-R, okay, I know it's not how you spell pure, but pure ag, Kansas is purely ag. The largest industry in Kansas is agriculture, and so the largest bases are purines, and they are A and G. And then by default, you have T and C, which are the complementary base pairs. Now, if we talk about Rosalind Franklin and Watson and Crick, remember, Watson and Crick are the ones that actually won the Nobel Prize. They produced the three-dimensional model of the double helix of DNA, but they used Franklin's picture in order to come up with that. And a lot of people, a lot of scientists would say that uh, it is impossible or would be impossible for them to actually come up with a three-dimensional structure of DNA if Franklin hadn't taken her pictures. Um, and they didn't give Franklin credit for taking those pictures, which are the pictures they built their model on. And so you decide. Um, but well, Rosalind Franklin, like I said before, was the lady scientist that used x-ray um, techniques in order to come up with a picture of this three-dimensional model of DNA. Next lecture is going to be specifically on the structure of DNA, the structure of the nucleotide, how the nucleotides come together to produce the, uh, the three-dimensional model of DNA, the double helix. Uh, but until then, see you.